Hey, hey everyone, it's your Peacekeeper, and it's time for the next video in our How to Play series on the Russian Destroyer line. This is the Tier 8 Ognevoy class destroyer, which is in the split off from the main line. And the Ognevoy class destroyers were a class of 24 planned, but only 11 completed destroyers built for the Soviet and Bulgarian navies. Labeled as Project 30 and Project 30K, these ships were built to fix the problems with the preceding Project 7 and Project 7U Gnevni class destroyers. The Ognevoy class featured a strengthened and enlarged hull with additional hull plating. Overall, hull height was also increased to increase ship freeboard, which allowed the ship to be a little bit more survivable. And the machinery spaces resembled that of Gnevni, except that they were spread out some to allow for better maintenance and more room around the engines. In terms of armament, Ognevoy built upon the successful turret design for this, the destroyer Tashkent. And, ironically enough, the turrets on Ognevoy herself, or his self, are actually from Tashkent. <laughs> like, literally, Tashkent was sunk. They pulled the guns off of Tashkent and put them on Ognevoy. Ognevoy, in case you're wondering, it means fiery. In terms of service history, only Ognevoy and Venus Hitlny were completed during World War II due to the German invasion of Russia in 1941. The ships being built in Nikolaev were either decommissioned before they were launched, and by decommissioned I mean demolished before they were launched, to prevent their capture, or they were removed from their slipways and transported to other shipyards. Uh, ships being built elsewhere had their production suspended until after the war, and the other nine ships were completed then. So, uh, the only two ships completed during World War II, Ognevoy and Venus Hitlny, I literally cannot find any information about any of the ships to give any further information. Like, there's no other English sources that talk about these ships, aside from the fact that they served well into the 1960s when they were scrapped, finally. In terms of their in-game play style, Ognevoy takes us back to a time when the Russian destroyers relied upon their torpedoes for their primary damage output. The ship's quintuple torpedo mounts are packed with 10-kilometer torpedoes, and while not the fastest or hardest-hitting torpedoes at this tier, they have a relatively low detection range that makes achieving hits on unaware targets very easy. The torpedo reload is also very quick for a Tier 8 destroyer, further emphasizing the use of those torpedoes over the guns on board. Ognevoy also boasts excellent concealment for a Russian destroyer, with the full concealment spec ship hitting 6.1 kilometers in detection range, which I think is either third or fourth best overall. Still very, very stealthy, especially considering Kiev, Tashkent, Habarovsk, the, all of those ships have significantly larger cruiser levels of detection. Her gunnery is distinctly average, and at this tier, I'd actually put Ognevoy's guns at a dead even heat with Kagero's guns, primarily due to the fact that Ognevoy lacks in gun accuracy, even though she has higher rate of fire. I just don't like Ognevoy's accuracy, especially when it comes to hunting down other destroyers. In terms of turret rotation, yeah, they're quicker, so it's going to be a little bit better than Kagero is in a knife fight. But at the ranges at which Russian destroyers are best played at, those mid to long ranges for destroyers, so we're talking like 7 to 12k, uh, it, to me it just feels like Kagero's guns are just significantly more useful. Ognevoy is also pretty quick for a Tier 8 destroyer at 37 knots, and Ognevoy is the first Russian destroyer to gain access to the defensive fire consumable. However, her anti-aircraft battery is really quite weak for any destroyer, let alone a destroyer with defensive fire, so the, the, that's kind of like a token, I guess. I'm sure if you spec the ship out in a full anti-aircraft build with the correct modules, and all of that, uh, you know, you could boast the AA to be decently respectable, but at this tier, quite honestly, Benson is a far better choice for any aircraft duty, as well as Akizuki, believe it or not. Okay, let's talk about some stats. So, 16,100 hit points, up to 20 millimeters of armor, which I'm guessing is going to be uh, nowhere near your hole plating. Well, you got 19 anyway, so that's pretty respectable, uh, and... In terms of main battery, we have those two dual 
130 millimeter 55 caliber B2U gun mounts, literally taken from the destroyer Tashkent, coming next week. There they are on Tashkent. And they have a main battery firing range of 12 kilometers, four and a half second reload time. That's going to be without basic firing training. 180 degree turn time of nine seconds, so exceptionally quick turret traverse. 8% fire chance, 1900 HE shell damage, 2600 AP shell damage, and 12 kilometers in range, as I already said. Unfortunately, we lose the secondaries that Kiev has. Man, I missed them already. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And let's talk about the real gem on this ship, those torpedoes. Again, you have two quintuple launchers. That's five torpedoes per launcher, so 10 total torpedoes, 10 kilometer range, 56 knot speed, so really quite slow. And they only do 15,100 damage, but they have a detection range of 1.1 kilometer and a reload time of 92 seconds. That's Really, really, really useful. In fact, I think if you go and look at the German destroyer at this tier, I think we're looking at pretty comparable reload times on those uh, torpedoes. In terms of anti-aircraft defense, again, the ship's anti-aircraft suite is really quite lacking, but you've got four 50 caliber guns or 12.7 millimeter guns, 1.2 kilometer range on those. You've got six single 37 millimeter guns with a 3.2 kilometer range. One dual 76 millimeter turret, which if this was Kiev would be a secondary. <laughs> Four, you've got uh, three and a half kilometer range there. And then the main battery, which is uh, those 130 millimeter guns, 5.2 kilometer firing range. In terms of max speed, 37 knots, 610 meter turning radius, 3.8 second rudder shift time, which is a little slow, but not too bad. Concealment range by sea, the other gem of this ship, 6.1 kilometers and only 3.1 kilometers by air. So let's talk about some upgrades. In terms of upgrades, I'm going to recommend using main armament mod 1 in the first slot. This is going to increase your uh, main battery and torpedo tube hit points by 50%. It's going to reduce the chance of them becoming incapacitated by 20%, and it's going to decrease the time it takes to repair them by 20%. If you were going to spec this ship out as an AA cruiser, or sorry, a destroyer, I definitely, which I don't recommend, but if you're going to do that, Auxiliary Armaments Mod 1 is going to help bring some of those medium range stuff and keep them around. Uh, like I said, though, quite honestly, this ship is really rather poor in the anti-aircraft department. Really not uh, worth specking into AA at this point in this, this uh, destroyer line split. Magazine Mod 1, if you're interested, and a free debt flag, basically. In terms of the second slot, I'm running Aiming Systems Mod 1 for the 7% reduction in dispersion of your main battery, increasing those torpedo tube traverse speed by an additional 20% so that they turn faster and we don't care about the secondaries because this ship is not Kiev. In terms of the other upgrades, though, AA Guns Mod 2. Again, if you're specking this ship into an AA role for, let's say... Team Battles or something like that, if Team Battles, team battles ever comes back. Uh, you could definitely pick up AA Guns Mod 2 to bo uh, boost the range an additional 20%. Main Battery Mod 2, not recommended because your tra traverse is already plenty quick. No use in losing rate of fire to get even quicker uh, turrets. You're not going to be winning any gun duels with the ship. Again, the strength is in the torpedoes. In the third slot, I'm running Propulsion Systems Mod 1 for the 20% reduction in the chance of your uh, engine being incapacitated and a 20% reduction in the time it takes to repair them. Uh, honorable mention here to Steering Gears Mod 1 if you're somebody who hates losing your steering more than you hate losing your engines. Steering Gears Mod 1 is definitely what I would recommend. These two right here are pretty much interchangeable. I personally think that losing the engine is a little bit more damning than losing the steering gears. So, especially with Last Stand, so I'm going to run Propulsion Systems Mod 1. Damage Control Systems Mod 1, really not that useful on a destroyer. Uh, engine Boost Mod 1, honorable mention here if you've got it. Uh, I'm Like I said, I'm saving mine for Habarovsk. I haven't had the opportunity to actually put it on her yet, him that yet, though. In the fourth slot, Steering Gears Mod 2, and that's because the rudder shift time without it is glacial for a destroyer. And while some people are saying, well, you need to speed tank, again, I personally find using the rudders 
to be the best method of mitigating as much damage as possible. So for me, a faster rudder is more important, except for in this last slot, and we'll talk about that. If you uh, can deal with that glacial rudder shift time, you can definitely pick up Propulsion Systems Mod 2 for the 50% reduction in the time it takes to reach full power when accelerating, as well as increasing engine power when the ship starts moving, and that's going to be in that negative 6 to 6 knot range, and it's not going to have any impact outside of that. Uh, if you're going to use smoke quite frequently, you know, this is definitely an option, or if you're going to camp behind islands. Personally, I find speed tanking, which is, you know, avoiding incoming fire with the fast speed of the ship. I definitely think the steering gears are a little bit more important for that. In the last slot, you can see I'm running Concealment Systems Mod 1 for the 10% reduction in the detection range of the ship, as well as a 5% increase in the dispersion of shells fired at you. And the reason for that is because 6.1 kilometers makes using those glacial moving torpedoes so much more comfortable because I can get that much closer to enemy ships before I launch. Now, the ideal range to launch them, you know, depending on the, the target's awareness of what's going on around them, is definitely going to be in that 7 kilometer area. So, you know, give or take half a kilometer from 7K. Um, and this just helps you get that much closer. Steering Gears Mod 3, if you're interested in not being a stealth build, uh, you could run this and then pick up uh, Propulsion Systems Mod 1 in the previous slot, or sorry, Propulsion Systems Mod 2 in the previous slot, and that would get, bring your rudder shift time down to where you could do both speed tanking and camping behind islands a little bit more effectively. Overall, though, I think decreasing the detection range is a significantly better mod for this slot. And on the same token, I definitely don't recommend Target Acquisition System Mod 1 because we're not going to be hunting down destroyers. So that means we're not really that worried about torpedoes. However, if you're going to be camping in smoke all the time, maybe this would be something useful to you. Again, Consumable Systems Mod 1 is my recommendation. So let's go look at those consumables because uh, you do have to give up engine boost in order to get defensive fire. It's there if you want to use it. Personally, like I said, the anti-aircraft suite on this ship isn't strong enough for me to really pick it over the engine boost and the ability to speed tank. Other than that, nothing really interesting to report. Smoke generator, still no heal yet. So got to hang out a little bit longer before we can get heals. And actually, I don't think we get heals in this line. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Anyway, let's go look at this ship in a battle video. All right, so this is going to be on the map Neighbors, which, if you've not heard me say it yet, is one of my favorite maps in the game. And the reason is because the map really, really gives you a lot of opportunities to play. Now, this is a Tier 8 fight. There are carriers on both sides, so that means that this is a legitimate game. And there are three, count them, three gunboat destroyers on the other side. So if this ain't legit, I don't know what else to tell you. Now, Neighbors, again, one of my favorite maps because you've got so much cover between you and the enemy. You've got a pretty large map, but it's not so large that it takes forever to get into a fight. It's just a really well-balanced map overall. And as you can see here, we've got ourselves... Uh, some decision-making to do on which direction we want to go. Now, the team, uh, this, is the, this is what I recommend. This map is best played when the majority of your team crashes B with a little bit of support at C. Going to A on this map takes you out of the fight for so long that you're really not impacting the game. I mean, the only way to make A, B work is if the vast majority of your team crashes B. Now, can it work? Absolutely. I've seen it work both ways. I've been on winning teams that went A, B. It's just that it's far easier when there's a lack of communication overall between the team to go B, C, simply because there's more cover. Ships tend to stay alive longer. We don't have to worry about all of our battleships going to A because reasons? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, thankfully we decide to go B, C because that's the easiest strategy. It may not be the best, but that's certainly the easiest. And for a while there, I really thought that this match was going to be a little hairy, actually, because, well, 
you'll see. I'm not going to spoil it. <laughs> what a tease. Anyway, so we're heading off to see to see what we can see. Uh, our Fubuki is going off to B? Question mark. Um, yeah. I think our carrier is by far the most clutch player in this entire match. I, you know, in spite of his griping at the very beginning about going to, you know, going to C and, and how teams that go to C tend to camp up there instead of actually playing for the objectives, etc., etc., etc. Um, he does a really good job. And this is a perfect example. You can see on the mini map, you can see that his fighters picked up the enemy fighters before they managed to get to my detection range. That is such a clutch move, and then he manages to get a successful strafe off without losing any of his own aircraft in the process. Fantastic CV gameplay from him on that, and absolutely critical to me getting into C and capping it without getting detected. Now, we're capping C, and it looks like their team is overwhelmingly going A, B. Keep in mind they have an extra destroyer than we do, and, well, that is always a risk. Now, that Edinburgh was 10.2k out and slowing down, and I knew that was going to happen because, well, it's a Royal Navy cruiser, and it seems like every time I want a Royal Navy cruiser to actually, like, stay stationary so they can torpedo him, they end up not doing that, at least not right away. Now... We're going to go ahead and try and get ourselves into position to do that, and in doing so, we are definitely going to run some risks. Now, there is a key in this match, and it is over off to the east of us. Now, the minimap says the southeast, but you're going to see it pop up briefly here as it gets spotted. Uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to try and get ourselves into position to launch torpedoes at this Edinburgh because he is camping in his smoke. And there is a Bismarck also coming through the same thing. So as soon as we get ourselves some... Yes, okay, so we're going to launch those torpedoes. And we're going to launch a set so that it looks like we're going to hit. And they actually will overlap a little bit. So we've managed to cap C pretty much uncontested. We've got ourselves a Bismarck coming in. We went ahead and fired just to kind of see if there are enemy ships around. There's the key popping up. So we should probably go head off this key at the pass, because if he gets a good spread on a broadside ship, he can do a pretty decent amount of damage. We need to go address that as best we possibly can. So I'm going to turn around now, and we're going to go try and address that with him. And our torpedoes are running hot, straight, and normal for the smoke cloud there, praying for a dead Edinburgh and maybe a heavily damaged battleship. And we look over just, oop, we got one torpedo hit. Can we get more? No. The Edinburgh managed to duck away. So now we need to make our decisions because there's the Edinburgh. We got a lot of heavy ships coming in. And, well, okay, so the Edinburgh is turning away. What's the Bismarck going to do? Because we got 20 seconds before our torpedoes are coming up. Okay, so he's going to turn out and away. That means by the time our torpedoes get up, we should be able to launch a pretty devastating spread, provided he, you know, doesn't make any sudden changes to his itinerary. And because these torpedoes are very slow, you need to launch them, especially if a ship is making turns like this. You need to give yourself a pretty healthy lead, especially at these closer ranges. So you can see here I'm over halfway above on the indicator there. And that, uh, that's going to anticipate his, you know, speeding up after the turn. And, well, it, we'll see in a minute just what that ends up doing. But because the torpedoes move so slow, you need to give yourself a lot extra range on those and an extra lead in order to get them. Now, it came up here. My plan was to provide smoke for this Atago. However, or Atago, however you want to say that. However, he, uh, he's really not doing too shabby right now by himself. Seems like the fire he is getting is from secondaries, from the Bismarck. Nothing too heavy. I think he'll be all right. So we're going to save our smoke. We are going to, however, look and see what we've got. There's two, three, four, five, six torpedo hits and a devastating strike. 62,791 damage in seven torpedo strikes. Now we've got ourselves a key over here. And, well, we got about 30 seconds before our torpedoes are going to be up. And so that means we need to make up our mind of where we're going to go. We also have a cyclone coming in, which means 
Uh, that could also complicate things a little bit, but overwhelmingly though, I was going to slow down, but decided that we should probably go ahead and keep going through this island. That will get us back into this fight. That'll help us head off the one destroyer that they have left. You can see I'm still alive, which is important. And I've yet to be detected this entire match. So far. So far. Oh boy. Are things going to change? That is the question you are all asking. And the answer is yes. Yes, they are. Not to spoil things, but... Went ahead and launched those basically right at the, the marker there, hoping that the key remains on target. However, our clutch carrier has decided that he is going to launch an attack on this key. And as a result, he will ultimately turn out and away and we will miss. Or actually, I think he turns in. Either way, he turns and we end up not getting any torpedo hits off of that because of our carrier's actions. Now, this is one area where I wish our, uh, our carriers would be paying more attention to the mini map because I could have quite as easily killed that key. He was moving hot and heavy. And look at how far ahead those were. I mean, had the key not turned, we probably would have been good to go. Probably would have gotten ourselves a couple of torpedo hits. Maybe even killed him. As it stands right now, you know, the carrier got one torpedo hit and maybe a couple thousand in damage. Yeah, would have been nicer to kill him. So here we are, letting the Alabama know that I'm gonna smoke him up so that he can take out this key. We're gonna go off to his right-hand side there as he fires off a salvo. We want to get ahead of him before we start launching. A little bit behind him there. Probably could have waited just a little bit longer. But providing smoke for your friendlies, it's one of the stronger aspects of this ship. However, one thing I forgot to pay attention to was my distance to the key. <laughs> Ooh, we got a little bit close. Well, dear Smoke Cloud, please hurry up. Thank you. <laughs> Now we're going to show just how anemic the guns are. So we went ahead and we launched torpedoes, and you can see here he is just getting absolutely shredded. And, okay, so 942 damage. I mean, I guess it could be worse. Just really, yep, yeah, 628. Accuracy is actually holding up decently for us there, but that's about the extent of it. The key manages to go down. That's our second kill of the match, 65,250 damage. Now it's time to go push to B because we need to cap B. We need that area and we need somebody to kill off this turpits fast. I was really hoping that the Alabama would do that simply because the Alabama, you know, could actually kill this turpits with its angle. And unfortunately, he disappears before we we're able to do that, which eh, that kind of is annoying. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to try and push over into B do some scouting, see if we can't maybe find ourselves a cruiser. Maybe when our smoke gets up in a minute and 30, we can uh, provide the additional smoke for the Alabama. But you can see kind of where I'm at so far. Haven't really used the guns a lot. In fact, this is the play style that if you are a Japanese uh, destroyer captain that does not like to use the guns, which that's a different discussion for a different time, um, this ship should feel right at home for you. In fact, this would be fantastic practice for using torpedoes on the Japanese torpedo line, the torpedo boats, because of the way that the ships, um, because of the way that the ships actually uh, lacks in the gunnery department. Now we are detected. This Edinburgh pops up danger close. We're going to launch what I'm going to call a panic spread here. Um, and well, yeah, so we're close. We're close enough that we can use AP. I'm going to turn into him. That's going to minimize damage as best I possibly can. We've switched to AP. We fired off a salvo. Yeah, we're bouncing. So not a whole lot of help there. Definitely need to get the heck out of Dodge. Probably should have been paying a little bit better attention. I thought I'd have a little bit more support coming through this. And yep, we're getting pummeled by two cruisers. Not a good place to be, especially with this low hit points and with our our um, smoke being that far away. Ouch. Hey, we got a Citadel. <laughs> no. So we went ahead and we managed to pop smoke. Perfect timing. We managed to save ourselves and we managed to avoid taking any more real damage. We do need to address this Nuremberg, though, which means we need to continue to fire at him. Now, Nuremberg has a pretty soft citadel and pretty soft armor overall. 
and our torpedoes went out there, didn't pay really a whole lot of attention to them, and the Edinburgh disappears before I'm able to spot whether or not they're going to hit them. I didn't think they would, but some days you never know. So we're shooting AP at this Nuremberg, and, well, getting a lot of bounces, so it's time to switch back to HE, and maybe, wow, I completely missed that time. So one last salvo here at him, because he managed to disappear. We're out of our engine boost consumable, which means we are, well, we're kind of at a decision-making time. We can loop back around, maybe have some smoke available for other ships, maybe use this Alabama to our advantage and, and use him to push up a little bit better. But one thing that that is coming through is this Tirpitz up in the north. And there you can see him, he just popped up. He's been spotted by the aircraft. We could put ourselves into position to actually successfully attack him, or we could play really passive and try and spot and do all of that. Personally, uh, I'm not too keen on getting in a, in a point-blank range battle with the Tirpitz. And the unfortunate part about Cyclones is that 8-kilometer detection range, you know, that only gives you about 1.9 kilometers to work with. That's not a whole lot. And I finally recognize here that maybe we should probably address <laughs> the more pressing issue here, which is Tirpitz. <laughs> uh, yep, there he is. So he finally popped up, and unfortunately I am steaming full steam ahead towards him. And our Alabama is not in any good shape to continue to tank, but we're going to launch torpedoes. You notice I launched them there ahead of him because I was anticipating him turning out. We're going to go ahead and do what damage we can because inevitably we are going to die and dispersion and RNG saves us for another salvo. Oh my, there comes more and we're still alive. We have 125 hit points. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. I promise you we can do it. Look at that. We're just avoiding damage altogether. Oh, he ducks the torpedoes. Well, all right, and we finally get taken out by secondaries, but not before getting ourselves a fire that will cap out our damage. So you can see what I was talking about here with the torpedoes and, and the, the strength of the ship being primarily in the torpedoes. And that is an unusual trait, especially at higher tiers for the Russian destroyers. That's not to say it's a bad thing. It just means that as a destroyer, uh, you're going to have to know how to use those torpedoes, and unfortunately, up until this point, there hasn't been much of an opportunity to use longer-range torpedoes. Sure, if you're going down the destroyer leader line, you get Kiev's, I think it's 8 kilometers is what she gets, uh, he gets, sorry. And that's great, except for that's the other tier 8. So you're stuck basically at the low tiers with 4 kilometers. There's a couple of ships that are a little bit more than that, but not a whole lot of extra breathing room there. And now all of a sudden we get 10k torps on a ship that has absolutely mediocre guns at best. And, well, if you're not used to playing that, that can be a bit of a culture shock because you're expecting the line to be very strong gunboats. And what you end up getting is actually a ship that is really quite bad at being a gunboat. Um, it, it, the guns really are quite lackluster, and you can see 73 shell hits, only one fire. Um, and you'll see at the end screen here when we get done with this battle that really there's nothing... That, that we didn't really do that much damage with fire and our actual HE spam. The vast majority of our damage was done by those seven torpedoes that hit the Bismarck. In fact, all seven of them hit the Bismarck. Six of them at once. That ended his day. Probably a little bit sooner than he really wanted it to. But, hey, that's what he gets for, uh, you know, presenting the perfect opportunity. <laughs> so now we basically get to sit and watch the rest of this match and, and kind of contemplate some of the things that make Ognavoy the ship that it is. You know, it's unique in the fact that it has a really low detection range for a Russian destroyer. It has really rather weak guns for a Russian destroyer. And it has really good torpedoes, which may maybe really good is the wrong way to word that. It has solid torpedoes that are its primary damage dealing capability. So that really helps her, uh, him out a lot. But 
that's unusual. You know, that's not something that the Russian destroyer line is particularly well known for. And as a result, uh, it makes for a, a bit of a challenging gameplay style. At least Kiev has guns that he can use to engage other ships with success. Whereas Ognavoy really doesn't even have that. And unless you're sitting in smoke, you know, you don't really have a whole lot of speed to do a lot of speed tanking with. Some, yes, not a whole lot. Uh, you know, 37 knots is pretty respectable. We shouldn't really complain too much about that. Throw a speed flag on there that gets you to 39-ish, and then throw in speed boost. That, that'll pump you over 40, which is decent, but f a far cry from the, you know, 45 knots attainable by Kiev in the same situation. And, you know, that, like I said, that's a bit of a culture shock. I, I, I don't think a lot of people are really expecting that. Now, uh, I know the discussion is going to come up in the comments, so I'll kind of give my thoughts on it. Um, using torpedo acceleration on this, you know, there's certainly that there's certainly a case that could be made to that. This captain already is fairly unique in the fact that this is one of the few Russian destroyer captains that I would recommend taking concealment expert. Um, so I could definitely see you using torpedo acceleration that would bump your torpedoes down to eight kilometers, but add five knots. You know, bump you up to 61, that'd be a little little bit more tolerable. I didn't get a whole lot of time to play around with it because the captain on this is only 10 points. And so that, that kind of leaves a little bit of open room for you guys to discuss. Let me know what you think down in the comments about that, and we'll... Uh, We'll, we'll have a good discussion about that. Maybe I'll revisit Ognavoy with a higher point captain and actually give that a test. Uh, it could be an interesting test, actually. Might have to actually do that and keep it around as opposed to selling it off, which is what I originally planned to do. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, Ognavoy, definitely a torpedo uh, boat, which is unusual. I know some people say... He's a hybrid. I'm not sure I really think he's a hybrid. I, I, I just don't trust the guns enough to really feel confident in their ability to deal damage. Um, and yes, that is me. You know, that that is me t saying that our carrier was absolute clutch. Um, that was also me saying that there was no way that they would have won even if the hood didn't die right away. But hey, what do I know? I'm just some random guy that plays this game. Was that ego? No, no, no. I'm not trying to be egotistical. I'm just looking at the battle the way it was portraying out there, I just don't see that as being the end game for it. Uh, Hood would have not been able to stay alive long enough to really matter. Okay, finally at the end of the battle, and yes, we won. Excellent. Got ourselves two kills, 88,936 damage. We even got a Citadel out of that, 1805 in base XP. Would have been higher had I had more chances to cap, but you can see back there, not a whole lot of damage done in Guns and Fire. Most of it done with Torpedoes and Flood. Anyway, Ognavoy, not a bad ship, just very different from the rest of the Russian Destroyer line thus far. And as a result, can be kind of frustrating. Anyway, I'm your Peacekeeper. Like, comment, subscribe, and thank you for watching.